Our guest this morning is Dr. James Barker. Dr. Barker is Associate Professor of History at Western Kentucky University, Bowling Green. James' research interests include early Christianity, New Testament, and ancient writing materials and processes. Dr. Barker has authored numerous scholarly articles and a monograph on the Dia Tesseron, of which Tatian's Dia Tesseron, Composition, Redaction, Recension, and Reception, is the topic of our discussion. Dr. Barker, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. We're discussing a man in his work that, for a period of time, had a lot of resonance on Eastern and specifically Syrian Christianity. Before we get into the work itself, though, we probably should go over who the man himself was. So could you tell us a little bit about Tatian? I should start by saying there's not a lot that we know about him. We know about his works and we know about what people said about him. But we don't know very much about him in his own words. We'll get to the Dia Tesseron, of course, which is my main interest in him. But he also wrote a famous oration to the Greeks. So he's in the middle part of the second century. And his oration is one of many apologetic works. He's in that first generation of apologists about 100 years after the Gospels are written where Christians are a teeny tiny minority in the Roman Empire. And so they're surrounded by Greek and Roman temples for gods and goddesses and altars everywhere. And these Christians are saying, you're all wrong. You need to stop practicing the religion of your ancestors. And you need to join this new religious movement, which we would call a cult in the kind of modern sense of, This is weird. This is new, uh, way too new to appeal to many Romans. And so Tatian was one of those guys who was really trying to say Christianity is the most rational religion. Greek and Roman religion will only lead you astray. And here's why you should believe what I believe. And Christianity, as we know, is an evangelistic religion from the get go and is trying to gain new converts but it's never a both and. It's not just let's fit Jesus into the Roman pantheon. It is let's burn down the Roman pantheon and everything in it and just worship the God of Israel, Jesus, his son, and and the Holy Spirit. So Tatian fits into that, especially alongside Justin Martyr. Tatian has a reference to Justin in his oration to the Greeks. So we know he had read Justin It is widely believed and has been said since the second century that Tatian studied under Justin at one time, and that might have been the case, but Tatian never actually says that himself. So we know that he was an early apologist. From reading the oration, it's very clear that he has a high degree of education. His rhetorical savvy is far beyond anyone who wrote anything that's in the New Testament. So he is very learned and leaves behind the oration, which we still have, the Dia Tesseron, which we don't have, but can reconstruct pretty well. Yeah, Tatian's a figure that we explored in the very first episode of my project on ancient barbarian wisdom. You mentioned Tatian's oration to the Greeks, which is Perhaps one of the penultimate examples of this attempt by these early Christian rhetorical apologists to not only show that they've mastered the Greek paideia, but also one-upping it and appealing to this, what would seem from a Greek philosophical point of view, barbarian, foreign kind of knowledge with Moses, people like that. So Tatian's a very interesting, important figure. He's most known for Oration to the Greeks and the Dia Tesseron. The Dia Tesseron is effectively lost, but we do have several allusions to it, several sources that derive from it, and you go through that masterfully in your book. So if you could just kind of give us a brief rundown of what is the Dia Tesseron, is it fair to say that it's a harmony or is it a gospel? Sometimes the two are used interchangeably. So is it a gospel or is it a harmony? I always say yes. If I had to tilt the scales in one direction or the other, I would say that it's a harmony because what Tatian does is carve up masterfully each of the four eventually canonical gospels, eventually being 
an important qualifier because there was no canon when he was writing his gospel. But it is a harmony in so far as it intricately interconnects all four canonical gospels into one coherent story. It starts with the prologue of the Gospel of John. As you might imagine, we need to get Jesus' birth early in the story. We should probably end with his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And then in the middle, we have all of these teachings and all this other material that's well over 90% of the Gospels. And I always refer to those stories as a deck of cards. You can reshuffle that deck as many times as you want, and you can still have the story of Jesus. Once you get the prologue of John, you get the birth of Jesus, well, birth of John the Baptist even before that, but the birth of Jesus, one story from when he's 12 years old, you've only covered a few pages. And then the whole rest of the gospel story leading up to the, the passion narrative, you can rearrange those things any way you want. And that's exactly what Tatian did. He is, by my reckoning, the first to make a full-scale harmony. I mentioned his possible association with Justin Martyr. There's a long-standing argument that maybe Justin himself had made a harmony of the Gospels, or at least of the Synoptic Gospels. Maybe Tatian just interwove the Gospel of John into that. What Justin does when Justin quotes scripture is to make these sort of ad hoc harmonizations and sometimes even excerpt things that have no narrative coherence. He will just say things like, now let's talk about John the Baptist. And you can tell he's culling from all the gospels. He does not have a full-blown harmony. Tatian is one of the earliest to do this. We have other fragmentary harmonies, things like the so-called gospel of the Ibionites, the gospel of the Nazarenes, the gospel of the Hebrews. And these are almost entirely lost to us, except for a few excerpts from Christians who didn't like those books. The Dia Tesseron is different in that we have a very long and extremely complicated manuscript history of full-blown harmonies start to finish that either that are either almost exactly like what Tatian did or are very closely related to what he did. The flip side of that is there are a whole bunch of gospel harmonies that have absolutely no genetic relationship to Tatian whatsoever. So a lot of the last hundred years of scholarship on the Dia Tesseron was misguided in just assuming that if it's a harmony, it must be related to the Dia Tesseron. And the best way to figure out whether one harmony is related to Tatians or not is to look at the order of the stories. And so that's what I did in my book is to say, where did it start? Where did it end? And what came in the middle and in what order? Because there are some things that no two people would do independently. And so in that sense, it is absolutely 100% a harmony. But If by saying a harmony, you mean to devalue its significance, this is why some scholars insist on calling it a gospel, and they're not wrong either. It is absolutely 100% a gospel. And Matthew Crawford has written a a great article that's compelling to say, Tatian probably did not come up with the name Dia Tesseron, which in Greek just means out of the four the one gospel that Tatian made out of the four that were becoming the canonical ones. Tatian probably called what we call the Dia Tesseron, the gospel. Matt Crawford and Nick Zola co-edited a great collection of essays. I have a contribution to it as well, and it's called The Gospel of Tatian. To press that point, to say there was no canon, nobody was telling anybody not to write more gospels, Where did we get the infancy gospels, for example? So Tatian did this, and he did it extremely well. I mentioned earlier his very high degree of rhetorical education. He is displaying a a great degree of rhetorical savvy in the way he combines things. Not just large blocks of material. Where do I put this big story that's only in the Gospel of John? But on this micro level, word by word, phrase by phrase, here's something that's in all three of the Synoptic Gospels or all four of the Gospels. I'm just going to tell this story one time. 
and I'm going to use all four. And in one sentence, I might use two, three, or four gospels. That's an incredible amount of mental exertion to come up with something that rich. I think it's very important to point out the achievement of something like the Dia Tesseron, the amount of memory, the amount of knowledge, the amount of scribal work that went into creating this. Like you said, Tatian, as somebody who is so well-versed in that Greek paideia, he is kind of doing something similar that you see that Apuleius is doing in his Apologia, where he's defending himself against the charges of witchcraft. Apuleius is like, I'm not a magician. I don't know about any of this stuff. But then he proceeds to tell you all the different mystery cults and the different knowledge he has of all these different types of lore and ritual. Like every person who's trained in rhetoric at this time, Tatian is showing off. He's showing absolutely. off his knowledge. He's absolutely showing off. He's r- just firmly planted in that second sophistic tradition, as it's called, of I'm going to show you everything that I know about this, and then I'm going to tell you what you don't already know. It's not a great analogy, but the way you write a dissertation today is you start with your Forschungsbericht, right? You write this long, boring history of research just to show your committee that you know what you're talking about, that you know there's a need for the scholarship, and then you make your argument. So if you turn your dissertation into a book, the first thing you do is completely chop all those hundreds of hours of work that you did because nobody wants to read it. <laughs> if it gets published as a book, we take for granted that you know it. But if you look at something like Ovid and the Fosti, right? Like here are all the multiple origin stories for why we do X, Y, Z on ABC holidays. And so if you can't show off that you know that, then somebody who is very well educated, very well read is going to say, well, I don't know if I trust this guy or not. And the vast majority of writers were men, not exclusively, but predominantly. And so they're asking if these guys know what they're talking about. And Tatian is showing you that he knows things. One great example of that, I'm proud of this turn of phrase. I've said that the Gospel of Mark has so little material that isn't just absorbed into Matthew and Luke. And so Tatian will extract it with surgical precision and he'll drop in just two words here or just three words there or a two sentence episode here. And all of that tiny little Markan material is in there. So if you are a scholar of the Gospels, you can read the Diatessaron and you say, "Okay, I see what you did there. That's a good one, Tatian that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are nicknamed sons of thunder, right? Only Mark gives you that one word. Well, Tatian makes sure that that's in the Diatessaron. So he's got this goal of completeness, but with that goal of completeness is exactly what you're talking about. This rhetorical one-upmanship, I have mastered everything that came before. So here I am. So let's discuss the chronology and the choices that Tatian uses a bit. Can you go over these? I'll give you just the bare bones and the main one that really started me down this rabbit hole. I teach intro New Testament every semester. I spend a lot of time on the Gospels. And if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the most glaring discrepancies is the lack of a timeline of Jesus's ministry in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The 40-day temptation of Jesus is the single longest event in any of the three Gospels. And so from there, if you wanted to, if you just count up how many Sabbath days are mentioned, you could end up with as little as 100 days, and you've got the entire ministry of Jesus. Now, the complicating factor there is that you get these summary statements that I say in film terms would be like a montage where Jesus goes on a preaching tour. Or the disciples go on a preaching tour. And if you're a reader and you're thinking about, well, how long did that take? Was that a week or was that a month? And you don't know because they don't tell you. John gives you far fewer episodes in the life of Jesus, days in the life of Jesus. But he spreads it out over three Passovers, which is two full calendar years. People always say three years. I'm like, where do you get a third year, right? New Year's Day, 2022, 2023, 2024. That's 
two calendar years in those three holidays. So you've got a little bit of time before the first Passover in John, but it's basically a two-year ministry. So what did Tatian do? And I asked that question and I kept reading all the literature and I couldn't find anybody who had asked and answered that question. So I wrote a short article in New Testament Studies and what I found is that Tatian used all three Passovers from the Gospel of John But he also changed what happens when, and he puts a whole lot of Jesus's ministry prior to the first Passover. So the Dia Tesseron can get you close to a three-year ministry of Jesus, but he structures it around John's three Passovers, but he still rearranges John's festivals, and he takes events from Matthew, Mark, and Luke that don't even happen in Jerusalem. And he's like, eh, let's just tell that at a Passover. And John has this material where he's like, well, now this was the feast at Sukkot in the fall. And Tatian's like, yeah, I like that part. Okay, cut it in half. The rest of that, let's just relocate to a Passover. So he carves it up at will and reshuffles the deck, as I've said. But overall, he does keep a three Passover chronology that he inherits from the Gospel of John but he also exercises a great deal of liberty. And I would just tack onto that, that for me, this is one of the reasons I don't do historical Jesus research. If you're banging your head and saying, well, how and when and where exactly did this or that happen? You're never going to get a good answer to that. And even Origen knew that in the 200s. He said, you're just going to make yourself dizzy if you're trying to figure it out, because the Gospels already tell you the same thing happened at a different place or at a different time. And Origen said, I don't begrudge the evangelists for telling things in a different order. They just told the story the way they wanted to. And so Tatian takes all those stories and says, yeah, I can put them in a different order. Sometimes Tatian likes to cluster characters and events. So I mentioned taking stuff from John's gospel, you know, from the synoptics and putting it in Passover's scenarios or Sukkot. When we get to Sukkot in the gospel of John, Tatian tells that story. And then all of a sudden, all of these rich guys or people with questions about money that you know from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Tatian tells them all in order. He puts all the rich guys together. None of that happens at Sukkot because none of that happens in Jerusalem in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Tatian says, I like all these money, man. Let me cluster them together. And it's like one after another, they just go across the stage and ask Jesus their money questions. So you can see a tendency to group things thematically. You can see that he's heavily indebted to John's chronology, but not constrained by John's chronology because Tatian very clearly reworks it at will. Why do you think Tatian is putting these concepts in the order, like putting the rich interlocutors together thematically? What is his theological point in doing this? I'm not sure how theological it is and how much it's just practical in his mind of let me cluster these together. He does a similar thing. Nicodemus shows up in chapter 3 in the Gospel of John at a Passover. He shows up then again in chapter 7 and 8, the Feast of Sukkot. And this is like a year and a half later. Part of Tatian's reasoning for relocating that material is that you get the two Nicodemus appearances back to back. It's, I think, very much in film terms. So it's like we've got this actor cast as Nicodemus. We've got him for one day. We're going to shoot these scenes in this order. John splits them out into very separate episodes And Tatian's like, no, why don't we just keep them together? It actually works to have this character come and and be involved at at this point. So yeah, I, I think it's just something he likes to do. He has a similar thing where Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me. And Peter is smart enough to say, here's a wild idea, Jesus. How about we not go to Jerusalem? And Jesus says, shut up, Peter, right? Jesus keeps telling them, we're going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. We're going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. And all of a sudden, you have this transfiguration scene, which is literally the middle of the Gospel of Mark. Like if you have a scroll and you fold it in half, that is the story that is the turning point of the Gospel. 
Jesus is now talking to Moses and Elijah. And re ancient readers are expected to know those guys have been dead for more than 700 years uh, to 1,200 years, respectively, for Elijah and Moses. So they show up. Jesus is somehow radically transformed. And he comes down the mountain and he tells Peter, James, and John, hey, I'm going to die. And all of a sudden, Tatian interjects this episode from the Gospel of Luke where the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, hey, Herod Antipas is trying to kill you. Now, if you've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is no easier way to harmonize these at that point than to have Jesus come down the mountain from the transfiguration and then perform an exorcism. This guy's poor son is you know, frothing at the mouth. He's throwing himself in the fire. He's throwing himself in the water. All three tell that. And all of a sudden, Tatian says, no, no, no. Jesus has just said again, I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. Let's relocate this thing to have yet another warning of my impending death, my inevitable death. So again, it's just his liberty and his prerogative as an author to say, I can rearrange this stuff however I want. But then once you see, oh, I, I see what you did there. It's kind of clever. At one point, there's this random woman in the Gospel of Luke, and she just screams out in the crowd, blessed is the womb that bore you, Jesus, and blessed are the breasts that you nursed at. So Tatian rewrites that so that it occurs when Jesus's mother and his brothers come to see him. So Mother Mary is right there when some other random woman is like, blessed is your mother, and Jesus can just look at Mary. It's so clever, but Luke's gospel is the only one that gives you that story about the random woman. She's nowhere near that story from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus's family comes to him. Tatian puts it together, but when he does, it's compelling. So he's a pretty smart guy, and he sees things that are similar. He groups them, and then he says, that actually works. And if you imagine that on screen, it actually plays out. There is one film one Jesus film that actually does that, puts Mary in the scene where the woman blesses Jesus's mother. A part of me is wondering how much his educational training came into play in terms of putting those things together thematically. Is he working upon theories of ancient rhetoric in terms of how you group things together? It also ties into my next question, just in terms of how the Dia Tesseron was put together. There are several competing theories, and it's a fascinating look that you give in the book about the processes and materials by which literary works were assembled in antiquity and how Tatian would have put this together. So I didn't know if you could talk about this a bit. I think for writing anything in antiquity, this is so overlooked. And it's not as though people haven't written about it, but there's not nearly en enough attention to it, especially in gospel studies, in my opinion. So the processes for writing a book you start by learning the alphabet and you write on a waxed tablet. And we know this because we have tons of them excavated. Scholars tend not to talk about them very much. John Poirier is a notable exception who's written a really good article about how Luke might have used them. He got some immediate criticism and I defended him in some things I've written and said, Jack's actually right about this stuff. And since then, he's had a chance to defend himself and say, I'm right about it. Here's what a wax tablet looks like. I looked at our excavations of them and I just started experimenting with them. And so I made one. Yeah. And you know what? Looking at this wax tablet, it's about the size of a seven inch Kindle fire today, pretty much maybe a little bit yeah. bigger, right? Yeah. So <laughs> you're totally right. When we look at these texts from antiquity, we're thinking in terms of a book. We're thinking in terms yeah. of what we have now in terms of reading material and access to these materials. We're not thinking in terms of wax tablets in terms of the processes of rolling out scrolls, things like that. You just write, write your name in wax and then you just erase it as you want. This is a simple little triptych that has outside boards and then your middle board can be double-sided and then you can add more and more double-sided pages and a pentatic would have five boards but that would be a total of eight pages that you could write. You can write a, a couple thousand characters, which is about the size of a short pericope in the Gospels. And that's how you would draft a literary work. It's how people drafted literary works 
for a thousand years. So you still sometimes see these vestiges of oral composition that people were just making this up as they went along. And that is based on all my research, such an outmoded way of thinking about the gospels. It goes back to Homer and how people imagine that Homer or Homeric bards were working, you know, 700 years before the gospels were written. The problem is once we get to the time of Alexander the Great, we get some really sophisticated imitations of Homer. And we have people who have memorized Homer front to back, and they are not composing it orally. They are writing it out, and they are drafting it. And there's a great book by Peter Bink called The Well-Read Muse. And he says, you know, when Homer in the Iliad needs to recite the catalog of ships and captains, he appeals directly to the muses to inspire him. And you know what happens in the Alexandrian period? Once we get Hellenization, all of a sudden poets start appealing to the muse to dictate to them on their tablets. And Bing has a great line and says, it appears that the muses have learned to write. And so that is the model that we should carry forward into the time of the Gospels. Yeah, this is the way people have been writing for thousands of years. I mean, you even go back to ancient Mesopotamia. We imagine them writing on these huge, huge tablets but like, really, these things are no bigger, maybe smaller than the wax tablet you just showed me. These things are yeah, incredibly tiny. They, they do shrink over time. They get yeah. more economical. There's some Assyrian ones that are kind of like a kid's slate, you know, one page. But yeah, yeah. all types. But a Roman era tablet, mine's a pretty, pretty darn good model. And you alluded to memory, and memory is essential. And I alluded to people who had memorized the works of Homer forward and backward. I think that anyone who wrote a gospel, Tatian included, they had exceptional memory control of their source texts, but I do not think that they had them memorized. And the reason is it just takes exponentially more time to read a work repetitively and memorize it verbatim, especially something like Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are so similar already. When you see what Tatian did and that it's a word here, it's a word there, I think he's taking the time to look up his parallel stories in multiple sources. So how did he work? Well, he used his memory because he knew where to find things. So if you've got a scroll of the Gospel of John, it would look like this in Greek. And you would know how to find the story that you need. If it's the feeding of the 5,000, you can get to the point where you have that story. But I also think they have texts out in front of them. And I say plural, it's possible that Tatian did this all by himself. It's also possible that he worked in a group setting. There are innumerable ways to count how this could have been done. I can have four students in my school and I can give each of them one of the four gospels and I can have my wax tablet and we can go through the feeding of the 5,000. We can read it and reread it and I can go word by word and say, oh, I like that phrase. Yes, let's use the individual speaking parts that John uses for Philip and Andrew. Now let's switch back over to Mark for this line of where are we going to get the food? So I think that this is very close scrutiny, very close study, repetitive reading, and not the kind of thing that anybody could do realistically just from memory. So I think a literary circle Tatian in a, with a small scriptorium makes a ton of sense to me, yet I don't rule out the possibility that he just had some paperweights and he held open his separate Gospels and he did it himself because he didn't like working in a, in a group. We've all been assigned a group project and we had the slacker that we didn't want to work with and our grade suffered because of it. He could have worked as an individual if he wanted to. He also could have worked in a small or a large group. It is innumerable how many ways he could have done it. But I think that it is very close scrutiny, repetitive reading. Read that line again. Now, what did Matthew say there? 
we going to use that? Are we going to not? Bouncing ideas off each other, I think, works really well as a model for how that could work. Or it could all just be Tatian, but those would still be the questions he's asking himself. Am I going to use this line from Luke or not? Am I going to save that for later? What am I going to do here and there and everywhere? I think just in terms of your theory about a literary circle is probably the most plausible, but at the same time, the elephant in the room. And I might just be doing some irresponsible speculation based on Tatian's high level of education, which would tell you something just by how expensive, how time-consuming obtaining some this level of paideia would be about Tatian's social class and the type of access oh. to, let's just say, social accessories and extensions, otherwise known as slaves, that Tatian would have access to in this creation of the Diatessaron. It's just a speculation, but do you think that he's got highly lurid slaves who are helping him put this together as well? It's entirely possible, and we definitely don't pay enough attention to that. If we think about you know, Pliny, Pliny the Younger talks about Pliny the Elder saying, yeah, he would you know, be getting a nice massage as he dictated to his slave. So we know that that was part of it, and it could have been... And with literacy, there are a lot of different types, right? The, the scenario that I gave, you could have four individuals who are at least capable of reading. But for us, it's kind of hard to dissociate reading from writing. They're entirely different activities. I can draw and color with my kids, but, but I, I'm not going to have anything hang in a gallery ever, right? The graphic capability that goes into writing, thanks to public education and Communist Manifesto, right? We all learn to read and write simultaneously. There's absolutely no reason why those have to go together. So being able to read a text with great facility does not mean that you could compose a work yourself. So he could have students who are at the level where they can read, and he may be the only person in the room who's capable of writing. He's certainly the only person in the room at his level, because we've talked repeatedly and deservedly about his exceptionally high rhetorical savvy, just how well-educated he is. I don't think any of his assistants, whether they're free, freed, or enslaved, are approaching him at all on any sort of calculus as far as his abilities. But if he's working in a group setting, then they're able to read and they're able to bounce ideas around. And even somebody who's illiterate can be listening in on that conversation and say, hey, what if we do this here? Or, oh, that has a nice ring to it. I like that wording. You know, too many cooks may, may spoil the soup or whatever. But we could also imagine a pretty large group of people working this out. And I've actually done this in a classroom setting of saying, all right, let's take this one short story. Here it is in these multiple gospels. How are we going to do it? I'll just open up a Google Doc and I'll paste in all four versions. And I can do that with two students. I can do it with four students. I can do it with 40 students. So I think that we need to open our minds to multiple possibilities and scenarios and not just lock in on one thing or say, oh, well, everybody could remember everything so well in antiquity. He probably just wrote from memory. That's the last thing we should think. We should start thinking along the lines I'm laying out, but by no means stop with what I've said. We should continue on. Just as, as an aside, I always love the anecdote that Pliny tells about his uncle where every waking moment, it seemed, he was working on something. He was having something dictated to him. And yeah, it was all through his, uh, his servants, things like that. It's really incredible how this could have all come together. I, for one, am convinced of the argument that it was perhaps a literary circle, but you know, like you said, Tatian could have done it himself just with big rocks, paperweights on them. The Dia Tesseron actually has a very storied reception in antiquity. So I didn't know if you could talk about that. It is really mind boggling. It was very highly regarded and very well received for centuries. People wrote about it and they kept it and they copied it. We're not entirely sure what language it was originally written in. Uh, Greek or Syriac seem to be the most likely. Uh, and I don't rule out the possibility that Tatian himself made it in Greek and in Syriac. And we know that we have an Arabic translation from the Syriac. 
And so the Arabic versions that we get from the Middle Ages are our best reference point for what the Dia Tesseron said. The problem is those manuscripts are, are tricky and they don't always agree, but we are close to getting a new edition and translation of the Arabic and, and that's going to be the single greatest contribution to Dia Tesseron scholarship in well over 100 years from Mina Monier. And so that's going to be great. The Arabic, though, it's in the Antonicene Fathers. It's in the public domain. J. Hamlin Hill did a translation. These are all. You can read an English translation of the Arabic Dia Tesseron and have a really good idea of pretty much what Tatian did. But it's not exactly what he did. And what someone did in the West to get it into Latin was make a full-scale recension of the Dia Tesseron and actually undo some of the things that Tatian had done. And we end up with the 6th century Latin Codex Fuldensis, and it's an entire New Testament. But instead of the four individual Gospels, we have a harmony of the Gospels. It is very closely related to what Tatian did because, again, two people can't independently combine all these things in so many different ways. But it's also very clearly reworked. And I argue very strongly that it is derivative, that what you see in the Arabic is what Tatian did, how he ordered things. When you see things reordered in the Western tradition, first in Latin, we later get Dutch and German translations in the Middle Ages. This harmony never went away, was extremely popular in the West. It stayed there. It was exceptionally well received in the East, in Syriac. We have a commentary in the fourth century, the commentary on the gospel by Ephraim the Syrian. And it is a commentary on the Dia Tesseron. The problem with it is he skips around and he leaves out really large chunks. If you wrote a commentary today and sent it to your editor and you had skipped about a quarter of the book, your editor would probably send back that draft and say, can you write a commentary on the whole thing, please? Ephraim doesn't always give you everything you'd like to have, but he follows enough of the sequence to say, yeah, okay, the Arabic is what Tatian did. And occasionally he quotes it in Syriac as he had it. So that's really an important witness. It was used in churches in Syria, in public worship. And here's where a big misconception comes in. In the 400s, we get a new bishop who goes and says, okay, in about a quarter of my churches, turns out he had 800 churches under his purview. In about a quarter of them, they were using the combined Gospels. He means the Dia Tesseron. And I told them to replace those with separate gospel books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You will find no end of scholars saying, oh, they banned the Dia Tesseron. They burned the Dia Tesseron. They destroyed those copies. That's not at all what we are told. We're just told that the harmony was replaced with the separate gospels. And apparently it wasn't hard to get 200 gospel books in pretty short order. So in the 300s, Eusebius has heard of the Dia Tesseron, but doesn't appear to have read it himself. But somebody's reading it in the West after that and revising it. And that Western recension continues on. Eventually, it gets absorbed into Peter Comister's Historia Scholastica. It's a history of the world, but it just follows the Bible. But when he gets to the gospel part of it, He's got that harmony that was revised from what Tatian did, and then he starts to tweak it. So those are just a few of the tangents of where this goes, but it starts with Tatian in the East in Greek and or Syriac. Certainly it ends up in Syriac very early. When it goes into the Latin tradition, it's reworked in some notable ways. I have a few chapters of the book that talk specifically about how the structure of the harmony was reworked, but how it absolutely is still related to what Tatian had done. I don't say this in the book, but a question that I toss around in my mind is, if we're pretty sure, as I am, that this happens around the year 400, 
that it's reworked so much. Is it because Tatian is being disparaged as a heretic? He gets labeled as a heretic pretty early. So is it a way of kind of saying, oh, but it's not Tatian's Harmony of the Gospels. See, I reworked it some. (laughs) It's an interesting thought experiment. We can't prove it either way, but it would make sense to me that around the year 400, somebody would take it, admire it, but also kind of need a 2.0 not exactly what Tatian had did. Meanwhile, in the East, they just continue on with it and it never went away. And it goes pretty easily from Syriac into Arabic in a very literal translation. This is why Monnier's work is so important. The Arabic version has been disparaged itself for a century of scholarship. And Monnier shows in meticulous detail time after time, it's the scholars who are making this stuff up. The Arabic Diatessaron is actually incredibly faithful and is is not guilty of all these things it's been accused of. It really is our best source for it. We just need a new edition because the editions that we have, the editors have corrupted the text. The text itself from the manuscript tradition can actually be put together quite nicely. So that'll be a huge contribution. Nick Zola is going to make a, a new, is making a new edition of the Latin Codex Fuldensis, that will have an English translation because we don't learn Latin like school kids used to. So when we get those editions out, I hope that my book for the skeletal structure, how did you just make this thing? And how did you write anything in antiquity? How did you order the episodes? How do you know what's related to Tatian, what's not? I hope I've got that contribution, new editions of the primary texts themselves, the edited volume, The Gospel of Tatian by Crawford and Zola, an edition of Early Christianity, the journal that's going to come out later this year. There are a few really good starting points that those few of us working on the Dia Tesseron really hope will help propel another generation of study to say we're actually back at the right starting point. And we're not trying to erase the last century in its entirety by any means, but there's a whole lot of appeals to a whole lot of harmonies that aren't related to Tatian at all, and a whole lot of emphasis on this little micro level and using the wrong sources to try to sort things out, that if we go back to the macro level and just say, well, what did this thing even look like? And then we say, here are our best editions of it now get to work, we really can make some progress in very short order. And most of us doing this are are in our 40s, I think. And we're already going to be considered the old guys, I think. And I, I hope that there will be a whole lot of other people who say, well, now I'm resourced. I'm adequately resourced to dig into this for myself and go even deeper down this rabbit hole. So we can point the way. And I hope to be a part of that, hope to have contributed something to that because the text is endlessly fascinating. The way it was put together, the way it was received, it just can't get enough praise and attention. And so it's nice that it really is coming into sharper focus at long last. It's a text that has such far-reaching influence and really it's forgotten in so many ways for a book of such high-reaching influence and reception is something that I hope the audience will be interested in checking out further. And I would start with your book. It's really important to point out that as we've talked in the past, it's not just about getting to some fabled origins of something. The reception and how these people transform it and shape it based on their cultural needs is just as fascinating, if not more important. Yeah, I mean, one quick anecdote. I showed these Dutch and German harmonies that we have in the Middle Ages. Sometimes they reshuffle things very slightly. And I would ask, well, why is that? And in one clear case, you see at the beginning of multiple manuscripts, the feast days for all the saints. Now, none of that existed when Tatian wrote the Dia Tesseron or even when this Western recension was put together. But fast forward a thousand years, there was a pretty widely agreed upon in the West festival calendar. So at one point, you can tell that they just wanted the gospel reading for this feast day not to be broken up. 
and Tatian had broken it up, so they put it back together. And these are being copied. These are handheld size, very small. They're for personal use, for devotional use. In some cases, we know that they're copied by women in convents. And so you can see like somebody made a decision to say, I'm going to put this stuff back together so that I can use this gospel harmony to celebrate the feast days. And it's just fascinating to get a glimpse in the life of somebody from you know, 800 years ago who wanted to have this. It the, goes on and on. The same thing with books of hours that people would wear around their belt and they would pass through a cemetery and they would stop and they would pull out their book and they would say the prayer for the dead when you pass through a cemetery. And so you really can get this social history. I know we can't fully get this romantic ideology of, oh, I can get inside the mind of an ancient author and know their very thoughts. But I contend that on small levels, when you look at Tatian grouping the money men together, you absolutely can get inside the mind of an author. And that was something Tatian did over 1800 years ago. And it's just part of what really enlivens me why be a scholar if you can't have those aha moments of saying, I see what you did there. How interesting. And then you think, well, surely somebody's noticed this. And then you, you read high and low, and I got a pretty big stack of Diatessaron books and articles. And I thought, okay, I think I've figured something out. And it really does connect you across the centuries with this guy who's labeled a heretic who made this wonderful gospel book that was so revered for so long and then went missing and then turned up and it was not exactly in its original form. And when we can start to entertain those questions, I think anybody who hears me talk about it can tell I'm pretty passionate about it, but it really is that human story that gets lost. You get into the weeds of the line by line, manuscript by manuscript, and that's the only way to write a monograph the way I did. But it really is that personal interest and that social history. And then a thousand years after Tatian, what are these nuns doing in the convents in Belgium? These kinds of things are the things that keep you going in a project like that, where you could easily get bogged down in the details. You find something that someone's doing and you really do connect across the centuries with readers and writers and you say, okay, the media is different when it comes to my crude attempts to write on a wax tablet. But when you think about rearranging things, I also teach Jesus in film, and it just makes perfect sense to me. I think, oh, well, that's why you put those things together. What's anybody doing? Who, what is Franco Zeffirelli doing making Jesus of Nazareth as a miniseries, right? It's masterfully done. And he adds an episode here and he reshuffles the deck there. And you can see modern filmmakers at work. Mark Goodacre wrote a great article on this, the celluloid Jesus saying, why don't we just look at modern Jesus films to try to solve the synoptic problem? Because on an editorial level, yeah, the media are different. They didn't have lights, camera, action. We get that. But when you just talk about this episode and that episode both go in this one story, you can just do A or B or B or A and rearrange those things. It doesn't fundamentally alter the story. So yeah, there's so much excitement there and there is so much ingenuity and so much ability on his part that I think we should give it credit that he deserves. James, this has been a blast. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much. A pleasure talking to you.